Hi, everyone. Tara Schuster is here. Yay! <laughs> Hi, Hi, Tara. Welcome. Hi. Thank you so much for having me. So I saw on your Instagram today that you ran 10 miles and you did a <laughs> yes. little dance. And so I saw that. I don't know what time you posted it. And I've been running around. I went to the gym and then we're going to be selling our house in a couple of weeks. And so I've been like... <laughs> caulking and doing all this stuff. And uh, I was like, Oh, I gotta get a shower for the podcast. And I'm like, she ran 10 miles this morning. She'll understand that I'm not dressed. <laughs> I mean, if we're honest, I've thought about changing my Instagram bio to like always a little sweaty due to a run. Like <laughs> I, I feel like I'm just in between runs at this point. So I feel, yeah. Yeah. Are you training for something? Sort of, I'm sort of training for a half marathon, but I'm more training for what are the things I think I can't do. And then let me do them. Like, let me, like that. yeah, let me, you know, these sort of like labels we put on ourselves. I had always put on non athlete, can't run, can't do the mile. And so, I mean, it took like 10 years to get to this place where, but now I'm like, you know, who can run 10 miles? This gal can run 10 miles. I love uh, so, it. I love yeah. It. So that's why I'm doing a jig on Instagram. It was a great uh, jig. <laughs> Everyone should go watch it. I, I watched it like three times, I think. <laughs> well, that delights me. <laughs> yes. But that's funny you bring that up because I think I have spent most of my adult life, 30s and now into my 40s, doing the same thing. Like I had all these you know, as a little portly kid. And so I was told I couldn't run and, you know, I was strong. I could lift a lot of weights, but you know, you can't run. And so, right. you know, in my thirties, I took on triathlon and I was like, I can run slow, but look, watch me run, you know? But and that's so I still a that. run. Yeah. Run. Yeah. It's, um, it's funny. I feel like they should almost do away with, um, early education sports because it did so, it did not make me like want to be a runner. Like the presidential fitness awards. I don't know if you had that, but we they were did. like, yeah, they were miserable. They were like, can you do the long jump? You've never no. tried before, but suddenly do it in front of all of your classmates. And it was straight up just humiliating and probably kept me from sports and working out or, and thinking of working out as something that was good and fun. Yeah. for like until I was 25 and really only came upon running as a self-care remedy uh, for anxiety. It's the only reason yeah. I ever ran. Um, but I wonder how much quicker I would have come to it without the stupid presidential <laughs> fitness awards. I forgot it had a name, but absolutely. There were two kids. Well, I had a class of like seven. But there uh -huh. were two kids in my class that were speedy. They would just take off and run because you had a mile run. Yeah. You and like right. so many sit-ups. Yes, you did. There was a pull-up attempt and like only yes. two of them could do pull-ups. And, you know, 120 pounds in fifth grade, right? I mean, could mm -hmm. I act like who can do mm -hmm. a pull-up at that, you know? But I remember watching them do a pull-up and it was, so, it was just humiliating. And then yeah. it continued into... To middle school sports and then I had a coach tell me like I wasn't a runner even though I played basketball and I was like well what was I doing that whole game if that's not running if that's not running yeah I'm done with these labels that make us feel bad like any label I'm going to give myself from now on is going to be one that either feels awesome or is expansive or that I feel comfortable changing that it's like a work in progress label like yeah you know, as opposed to, I don't want to say the things I can't do anymore, like non-athlete, indoor kid, even if I'm more drawn towards those kinds of things, I, I just don't want to limit, I'm not going to limit myself anymore. That's way yeah. in the past. I love that. And even things like that, there's little digs like, oh, well, you have such a pretty face. Like you heard that as a kid, right? I mean, yeah. you're still thinking, well, at least I have a pretty face. I mean, that's one of those limiters too. Limiting. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Oh my gosh. Well, I'm so glad to talk to you. Let's do, for anyone who's never heard of you, what do you tell people? Like who you are, <laughs> what your story is, you know, your elevator pitch. I hate to call it that, but you know, people are tuning in and they're like, yeah. Oh, she sounds cool. She sounds like she dances on her Instagram, go follow. And then we'll, I'll make them buy the book at the end. Cause uh -huh. I do that. Um, but what is your story? Like, where do you come from and what has, has driven you to get where you are today? Yeah. So I was, it's an, it's an interesting um, time to be asking this question. Cause I find myself very much in transition. 
Um, but I was the vice president of talent and development at Comedy Central, where I oversaw shows like Key and Peele, the Emmy and Peabody Award winning, um, and just awesome show, Key and Peele. Yeah. Um, I oversaw a David Spade show for the network, Emmy Award winning at midnight. Um, I worked in comedy uh, for the past decade and kind of rose the ranks really quickly and took on a lot of responsibility for a long time. But what people didn't know was that I had grown up in a house where things came to die. Uh, my parents were extremely neglectful of both me and my sister um, and all the pets and all the plants and everything basically perished. And um, we made it out alive. But by the time I was 25, I was just this mess wreck disaster of a human I lived in a physical permanent anxiety attack where I could feel an anxiety knot sort of like on a shelf above my heart. And so I'd be like kneading at it all day. Like I, it was physically very painful. And wow. so then I'd go home and I'd self-medicate with weed and booze and boys and anything to distract me from the emotional pain that I was in. And it, it was funny because I was leading this double life of being really good at work and really terrible at living. So no one at work knew that I had these problems. None of my friends knew I had these problems um, because I had to survive. So I kind of even had to like minimize what I had been through. Sure. Um, and I might have kept going this way had I not hit rock bottom on my 25th birthday when I drunk dialed my therapist threatening to hurt myself. And, you know, if you ever really want to feel ashamed of yourself and like, oh, wow, I've crossed some major human boundaries. Like, I really recommend you drunk dial your therapist in a desperate state um, because that is a very shameful feeling. Yeah. Uh, and, um, you know, she tried to find me that night and hearing you know, the next morning playing back her voicemails and hearing the worry in her voice finally made me worried about myself. And it was that morning that I realized if I don't save my life, I'm not going to have much more of a life to live. And so I decided, okay, time to face facts. You don't have parents who are going to show up. You are not a princess. There's no like king and queen who are like going to come and rescue you you have to rescue you. The only, I, I didn't really know how, right? Like I didn't know what values were, what are principles, what are vegetables? Like genuinely, what are they? Which one should I be eating? Because uh, no one had taught me how to take care of myself. So that what I did know was that I could use the same sort of ambition and drive that had gotten me to an Ivy League college that had gotten me on the corporate ladder pretty young, I could use that um, curiosity and like go get this to reparent myself and, and create self-care. So that morning I started a Google doc where I just put my questions, you know, I mean, those were the questions. What are values? What are principles? What are vegetables? I just started listing my questions and attacking them by reading memoirs, um, by watching the parents of my friends, you know, like, well, they don't seem to be screaming at anyone at dinner. This seems more normal. This, <laughs> this, and, and what is this? Swiss chard? A vegetable? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Right. Like, what, are, what are they serving? And I did that for five years, um, really rigorously. And at the end of five years, I had a 600 page Google doc and I felt like a completely different person. I, I felt stable and, and then and like happy and stable felt beyond my means when I was 25. And that's sort of when I realized, oh, I have an offering. I, I have something that might be able to help other people. And I was an executive. I was still an executive at the time. Um, and fortunately, I worked in a place that was supportive of me putting this out. And so that's sort of, so I'm a former executive. I'm an author of this self-care memoir. Um, and I basically just want to Which is make, called? Like which is called, oops, that's how I'm bad at the elevator pitch. Um, 
which is called Buy Yourself the Fucking Lilies and Other Rituals to Fix Your Life from Someone Who's Been There. I'm the Someone Who's Been There. And it, it, it gives personal stories of tips and tricks and things I found. And I think why it sort of resonated so much is that I didn't want to try most of these things. Like, <laughs> like you know, I write um, extensively about a gratitude practice. I rolled my eyes and cursed the girl who suggested I try a gratitude practice. Like, right. that is so cheesy and miserable and like commonplace, no thanks. But of course it changed my life and changed my perspective. And now I can't, you know, live without it. And I've done it for 10 years consistently every morning. Right. Um, so I think I just show that you don't even have to, you don't have to be like a woo woo out there person for these things to work. And that it's important to try, you know, try and see what feels good for you, but that there's so much joy in taking responsibility for your life. Ah. Uh. My favorite word ever, responsibility. Yeah. Yeah. Because, I mean, so much of your story, I mean, you obviously have an extreme case and we're not in the business of comparing suffering, but it sounds like it was pretty, pretty rough. Um, but the idea of learning to reparent yourself, that is, you know, that's not a new concept, but it's new-ish. I feel like it's going to pop onto the the stage soon, like right after self-care, like now we're reparenting, you know? Yeah. Um, but that whole idea, like if someone didn't take care of you properly, you don't know how to take care of you properly. And it's that simple. It's, and there's no yeah. shame in it. And when you said, um, about drunk dialing your therapist, I can see your drunk dial and raise you one. <laughs> yeah. because I had a story where I had an attempted, um, and trigger warning, suicide talk. So if it bothers you, log off. Um, but I had an attempted at suicide when I was 21 and I ended up going to the hospital and the doctor saw me, my boyfriend was there. He was getting ready to let, let me go back home. Mm. Like with no like check in to like, just, okay, yes. you're fine. Go home. Like that's 2001. Yeah. Right. And I, I couldn't keep my mouth shut. I ended up cussing out this therapist to the yeah. point where, cause I was so loaded, like so loaded. Yeah. I had like a 3.0 blood, blood alcohol oh, wow. and to the point where they then did commit me. <laughs> wow. After that, it's so like the shame I had, like riding in the little van to go to, you know, the, right. the mental hospital after cussing out the therapist when I almost got to go home, but it was good that I did go. Um, right. So, I you know, things work out how they should, but I, I feel that moment where you're just like, Oh, well, it's funny because I talk about the shame part of it because I, I think we're in a moment where we're like, no shame, no shame at all. And I'm like, it was actually a healthy shame because I was like, ooh, that wasn't, that wasn't great. And what I'd say is like with your story, something that really resonates with me is that survivor voice that was like, no, I'm going to raise hell so that I don't get released and hurt myself because maybe, yeah. I mean, like it's possible yeah. my, my therapist after that drunk dial, you know, she said to me when I was feeling bad about it, well, that was healthy. Like the healthy part of you was saying, Hey, I need help. I'm going to do something extreme right now. And that changed my life. So I don't regret. Yeah. I'm embarrassed that I, that it, that it had to come to that. Like, I don't know how you right. don't feel a little embarrassed about it. Um, but I'm also very grateful that it happened. Right. And you kind of, over time, it becomes like that time you farted in front of your boyfriend, yeah. you know, it's like, Oh, that was like, not great. But, um, which I did that too. One time squatted down <laughs> and pick up a, a VCR tape and farted in front of my boyfriend. It, it happens. Awesome. I still hear it, you know? Um, <laughs> But yeah, it is, it is those moments that you can look back on and be like, gosh, I'm really glad that happened. And yeah. I actually have a friend who she's a trauma therapist, Britt Frank, mm -hmm. and she talks about even taking it one step further that when we start to heal our addictions or our trauma, that we actually can take time to thank our addictions yeah. because they saved us in a yeah. way, in a weird way, because they protected us for a period of time. And yeah. granted, we have to get through them and get over them. But that's how we knew that that's, that's how we knew to cope with all the bullshit from way yeah. back um, yeah. to move I, forward. 
I mean, you know, in some ways, the anxiety that I suffered from was simply a coping mechanism because it was a driver of get out of this house, save yourself, do these right. things, succeed, like that spirit to keep moving, which then became overwhelming anxiety. It was actually a healthy part of me trying to protect me, trying to help. As we grow older, though, and, you know, the, the big thing I'm learning in trauma therapy is... I'm actually an adult now. Like I'm not a child, right? right? Like I'm having these child responses, but through the eyes of a 35 year old, it's completely different. So I don't need the anxiety anymore. Like that coping mechanism just isn't necessary um, for my life now. And so can I let go? Like, can I, so, you know, I write a lot about it in the book, but it's definitely an evolving process. Yeah. And I had this weird kind of sense. I, I, know, I know looking back, I was super anxious and super mm. like bottled up and fearful. My driving mm. force was less anxiety, more fear. I was terrified mm. of making all the wrong decisions. I was terrified I was going to die. I was just terrified, mm. which I guess is a form of anxiety, but I remember it being like really big and fearful. But then when I left to go to college and never went back, um, it turned into something else. Did you experience that? Like it was a certain brand when you were in the house. And then when you kind of got free, you were like, yay, I'm free. But then it was like, oh, fuck, what is it? it it's almost like it morphed into something more dark or yeah, hopeless. I don't know. I don't even know if I'm making sense, but that, no, I just I, have this I like it, division. For me, I think it all kind of blended because I was so dependent on weed. And so it was just, I was so out of touch with my mood for a decade from 15 to 25, I couldn't tell you how I felt about anything. I, I felt, I mean, I was probably, if I was diagnosed then, it would have been somewhere in the PTSD realm. Like I was right. so dissociated from reality that that whole period to me is just like a different part of my life. Like I can't even say within it, <laughs> you know, like- I know, yeah. it, but now looking back, I'm like, whoa, like I used to feel that way, like weird. Like <laughs> yeah, it's, I, it's yeah. surprising. It's surprising. Yeah. So I want to get back to the 600 page Google document and this yeah. is kind of like a no brainer question, but how important is journaling? <laughs> oh my God. Well, if anybody, I don't know when this episode will come out, but I'm doing a journaling challenge on my Instagram right now um, with readers because journaling is my everything. The chapter in the book is titled uh, writing it down, save my life. Um, because before I started journaling, you know, like I was just saying, I had no idea what was going on inside of me. I would feel these waves of anxiety or depression or shame. And I'd have, you know, I'd just be like walking down the streets of Manhattan and then I couldn't get the sandwich I wanted. The sandwich store was sold out and I would hysterically weep. You know, I, like these, these weird things were like the circumstance did not merit my reactions. And I really didn't have a good sense of why or how this was happening. So a friend of mine who had sort of watched me implode suggested that I try this practice called the morning pages, which comes from Julia Cameron's The Artist's Way, which is a Bible to me. And basically when you wake up in the morning, before you've had time to go on Instagram, before you've had time to go on Facebook to see how many likes your perfectly carved pumpkin got, uh, <laughs> you, you word vomit exactly how you're feeling without editing, without thinking, without mediating in any kind of way, you write out how you feel for three pages. And at first I, I did, I was extremely resistant. I thought who has time to write three pages every morning? That's disgusting. And then like only broken narcissist journal, like journaling is for lame people who believe in like self-care and that's not me. Um, but again, I, you know, I was at a point where I was drunk dialing my therapist. So I, I, <laughs> I right. Kinda, we're not going to do that, but we're going to yeah. talk about yeah. So I was like, right. you know what, let me just try this and then I can be self-righteous about how much it sucks <laughs> and doesn't work. Right. And of right. course, pretty immediately I realized, oh, I'm like DMing with my soul. Like I am easily getting in touch 
with exactly what my fears are, some fears that I didn't even know I had. And it, you know, journaling is a practice of building self-awareness and, you know, the cure for any of, of these healing trauma is typically has a large dose of self-awareness of just knowing what is going on. And aside from trauma for everybody, a really strong sense of self-awareness is an enormous asset and tool. Um, in, I don't know a context in which it is not helpful and journaling is just a big shortcut because right. it's like forces you to get in the habit. And since none of us have that habit, um, it, it's really just to your benefit. So right. when people tell me they don't have time to journal, I just say, well, I don't have time not to journal anymore. Right. Right. I don't have time to ignore myself. And you raise such a good point about self-awareness. I do know one context where it's good not to have Ooh. it. And that's in public speaking only when you write on you, right. When you step on the stage, yeah, <laughs> lose no, I, all self-awareness and I agree. Forward, you know, I, I, like- I don't want to jinx myself, but I've gotten to the place in my, in speaking where you're completely right. When you first step up, it's like, do not think, don't think, don't think, don't think, don't think. but I'm um, become a better like listener and like being present enough yeah. to know what I'm talking like now I can I'm starting to like enjoy it because I'm like oh yeah. I'm here I'm present but you can't you cannot when you step on the stage yeah. and cannot. it takes a while to get there like I was really so my book came out um three months before we locked down last year so I yeah. would, had just like hit the road and was really starting to speak a lot but I noticed um I kind of got to that space where I you know I had generally what I was going to say but then you can really start to read the audience and be responsive and it gets yeah. to be really fun yeah um but then I had when the zoom locked down I had someone who approached me and they said well I want you to do an you know an online workshop and I need like 20 powerpoint slides um and I'm like oh I actually can't do that <laughs> And they're yeah. like, why not? And I'm like, because it screws me up. I can't. It's if not I'm watching my... the Zoom and no one's laughing and there's a slide. I'm like, I'll just. And they were like, we don't understand. I'm like, I just don't do slides. <laughs> you know what? To each her own. You know, you don't do slides. That sounds good to me. I Guess do, what? but it's like a picture of a, you know, oh. a lake. Yeah. I I, you know what I mean? But um, I, I, you have to do it enough to figure out what have it is. Have to be comfortable. And, yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, one of the, so side note when you, and I wanted to mention this at the beginning, when you said, um, David Spade, I had a really unhealthy love for him, like in fifth grade, <laughs> really? I used to watch like SNL and I just thought he was the great him and Jason Bateman, although my love for uh, Jason Bateman has not abated. <laughs> wow. Well, those, those are two great crushes. <laughs> Good guys. Hilarious. I approve of these. That's Excellent. great. Excellent. Yeah. Um, so tell everyone about your book, like what, when they go to buy it, cause they're going to run out and get it mm-hmm. after they hear you. So what, what can they expect? So, you know, in the book, I go through the tools that I developed over that five years to, um, save myself. And what I hope is that in telling my story, I make other people feel less alone, Um, And the way I try to accomplish that is by writing what I believe to be funny stories. So even when I'm talking about neglect, like I'm not trying to bum anybody out. Like, I think it's like the cheeriest like account of uh, chronic trauma and neglect. Um, But the reason I do that is because I think it's easier to deal with when you've got that kind of distance and easier to empathize with what that experience is like. And the book isn't just for people who went through um, traumatic childhoods. Most of my readers, you know, write to me and say, you know, I didn't have it, quote unquote, that bad, but I still have so many of the symptoms you had and I'm trying to figure it out. And your journey was really useful to me. And this tool really helped me. And what I see more and more is that it's pretty universal that people feel like they're not enough. Even if they had parents who nurtured the hell out of them, they still feel like I am not enough. I don't do enough. I am um, not productive enough. I'm not worthwhile. And the whole message of my book is that you are worth the fucking lilies. You are worth delighting in your life and taking care of yourself. And we often think that ignoring the past or just plowing forward is going to be a strategy that gets us ahead 
And you know, what I write is that which you do not deal with deals with you always, you know, it, it, you might not know it's dealing with you, but it's for sure why your relationships always end the exact same way, or it's for sure why you uh, have earned the same pattern with your dad um, in that relationship. Like they're all, and there are all these ways to actually become aware of that. And that's what I have in the book are sort of the tools that I used. So it's self-help or self-development, whatever, I don't care what you call it, as long as it's a book for those curious about how to become more themselves, how to bring a little more joy in their lives, how to take responsibility for their life in a way that is not overwhelming. Um, Because I really break it down. I, I think people get afraid that if they do take responsibility for their life, for their life just as it is, that it's gonna be overwhelming and not fun and wouldn't it be better just to ignore it? And I'm saying no because I did that and it didn't work. So here's another way. I like your quote about you have to deal with your past before. Wait, what did you say before? It Um, deals with you. Yeah, that which you do not deal with deals with you always. Yeah, so true, so true. And a lot of times you may not even realize it's it's bubbling underneath the surface. Like I have clients, like I used to have them do a personal narrative in the first week and so many of them started, I had a, Um, amazing childhood. And then like 74 pages later, they're like, my dad, blah, my mom. And I'm like, oh, well, this started and went a very different route. And it's not that we're blaming. It's just, you got to be able to like point a finger at like, oh, this makes sense. This makes sense. You know, and it makes sense. Like why I'm this way instead of being like, why am I such a piece of shit? who can't like eat well and get her shit together. You're like, oh, because this is why. Yeah, it's, it's a really important distinction I make. And I think a lot of what has resonated with readers is I don't blame my parents at all. I'm not even mad at them. They, you know, they, no parent sets out to mess up their kid. No parents like, oh, you know what my plan is, is to like neglect these children so that they write a book about it one day. Like for sure that wasn't on my parents' radar they were just doing the best they could given their life experience and the tools they had. And what I ultimately learned was it was completely not personal. You know, we think of our relationship with our parents as like the most personal relationship in the world. And it really just isn't, you know, they treat you the way they have been raised to treat anybody or the way that they treat the rest of the world. And it actually is quite freeing to step away from the narrative of my parents did this to me, specifically me. They, I don't even think that. My parents treated me the way they treated everyone else. And it's sad for them. And I'm okay. So, right. like, so there like, really is no one to blame. Right. And there is a great analogy I've heard somewhere about like the toolbox, right? And it's like, if we line up our toolboxes generationally, like if you crack mine open, I've got like the big garage craftsman with all my self-help parenting tools, like, like, let's listen to your feelings, express your anger. And then like, you go to my parents and they've got like a decent toolbox with like a hammer and a saw. And then you go to their parents' toolbox and it's like, you know, we got a, we got a hammer, bam, bam, bam. And so every generation does do better, I think, you know, as a whole, um, but you're right. They did the best they could. You know, but if they do the work, it's also like, you know, I I don't even think my parents have a toolbox. I think they're like, (laughs) what's a, what's a tool? Like they don't, uh, some people, I don't know, they don't get there and it's, it's not great. You know, like I also, I have a lot of empathy for what it would be like if I had no tools, if I didn't know how to care for myself, how upsetting that experience would be. I can have a lot of empathy for that. So I really, really step away from the blame and instead have come to a place of, well, what would that be like to really not know how to take care of myself? Oh, I actually can relate because I remember what that felt like and it wasn't good. And, and so the blame doesn't help me. It doesn't help me grow. It doesn't help them. Um, so it's, it's, um, sad when you give up blame, because then you're like, Oh, I've given up the chip on my shoulder. This was fun to complain about. (laughs) Yeah. 
but right. it's- and one of the first things you said was, you know, taking responsibility for your life. And that is really hard to do, but the gift of taking a hundred percent responsibility for everything that has happened to you, present, past, future is the gold because then, yeah. you know, you like all of a sudden, like the victim, the martyr, all these traits that you've been hauling around, they no longer have a voice. Cause you're like, yeah. you know, maybe I was a victim then, but I'm not anymore. Like I'm, I'm yeah. responsible. Yeah. I mean, the reason I like taking responsibility for my life is because I'm a control freak and I, <laughs> I'd rather it be on me because yeah. I can, you know, um, Victor Frankl and man's search for meaning. Um, I'm going to totally butcher his beautiful quote, but it's something like the last of human freedoms is our ability to choose our reaction to any, any circumstance. Now, Victor Frankl is writing from Auschwitz and is right. saying that he can control his reaction and that that is his freedom. So if Victor fucking Frankl in the Holocaust can make that kind of decision, yeah. I would like to think that I in Los Angeles in 2021 with food in the fridge, my freedom and my health can start to make choices where I really am in control of my reactions. Yes. And, and so, you know, it's partially because I'm a control freak, partially because so many wise leaders and, and, and thinkers, you know, throughout history have really found this ultimately that taking responsibility is a path to freedom. Um, and it, it just feels good. Like it feels so much better than like to anybody listening who's like, uh -huh, I don't know, I don't want to. Like I was there too. But chances are, if you're listening to a podcast like this, you intuit that there is another way. Like, you right. know that this can't, this can't be the right way. And anyone that's stuck around long enough with me, yeah, they, yeah. they know that too. And also an interesting thing about the morning pages, because I've been doing yeah. them for years as well. Um, that will help point out a lot that oh, yeah. will bring stuff to the surface. Like, Oh, that's actually my responsibility. Oh, that too. You know, you'll start to see where you do control your reactions, where you are able to take responsibility. Like for me, it was always like, why did I eat that pizza yesterday? It's not fair. And I'm like, Oh, so today, why don't I just choose to fuel my body better and not like beat myself up? Oh, and that's all in my morning pages. And it really sets me up for the whole day. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and it's, and it's just those simple things. Like I would complain a lot, like, why can't you get up a half an hour earlier? So you're not rushing to do these stupid morning pages. And after like two weeks of the same complaint, I was like, oh, the reason I'm not getting up earlier is because I'm drinking a bottle of wine at night. Okay. So maybe what if I drink two glasses of wine at the night before? And you can't, you would end up making these micro adjustments but I was, I was unaware of the patterns that were most driving me crazy. I, I really think until you commit them to the page and get them out of your head, they're just a lot more difficult to tackle. They're not real, they're, they're thought loops. But once there's something magical in seeing it physically on paper and your mind and your hand uniting to write it out, to make it a real thing in the real world, it's way easier to tackle. And I think it's important to note too, I get this from a lot of people. It's like, oh, well, I can't journal because someone will find it. You oh, journal I, and mm. you burn it, delete it, <laughs> throw it out. Like you, we're not keeping this for posterity. You do not want your morning pages for posterity. <laughs> well, so I actually write about this extensively because my journal was stolen from me as a child. Mine so too. it was yeah. red. I don't know if it was stolen. It was red. Mine was stolen by a family member and entered into my parents' divorce proceedings as evidence that I was a pathological liar at the age of 12. So it was used, so I'm just using this as an extreme. My own journal, my words were used to vilify me, my truth used to uh, assassinate my character by my own family in a divorce. So it was pretty not cool, pretty not good. Um, and so I was terrified of journaling. I, right. you know, people had suggested to me over the years over and over and over again, you should have a journal. 
it's like one of the first things that a therapist will tell you, um, it just does scientifically work. Like there've been so many studies on the benefits of, of journaling, but I was really resistant because of that initial horrible experience. Um, but something about the morning pages that it's not quite journaling, it's like something else. And I actually have kept all my morning pages for a decade. I have all of them. And you just keep them in a safe place, you know? And like, I don't have people in my life who are like gonna take my journal. Like, right. it's not as hard. I understand the fear because I've been through it. Um, but it's not worth, like the fear of having your journal read and ha- letting that stop you is not just not worth it. It's right. not worth what you're losing out in, in benefits. Exactly. Cause the whole exercise is what you're truly after. You're yeah. not necessarily after the, the keeping of, it. I mean, if you can't keep, right. it, keep it, but it's the exercise. And I actually have a client um, who she's artsy. And so she'll journal in the morning and then at night she'll paint over it. Oh, wow. And I, I was like, that. that's sort of genius. Beautiful. So she has a book of paintings, which is oh, her morning that's... pages. That's beautiful. And also I'm going to steal this advice for my readers who like, <laughs> who are like too afraid is like burn them or turn them into something else. Cause it, only if you're me and you think you might write a book about it one day, do you need the journals? Right. I keep mine too. I yeah. Like too. I need them. They've got, <laughs> they've got material in them, but if you don't, yeah, if you don't need them for that reason and, and it'd be better to do and to burn than not yeah. to do. Or if you type, I mean, there is a pen to paper component, but I'm, you know, when you're trying to get someone to journal, I'm like, I don't care how you do it. We just I don't care what somewhere. you do. Um, but a word document, I mean, type, 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 control a yeah. backspace gone, like, and you're gone. on with your day, you know? So, oh my goodness, Tara, we went over, um, I said, no one gets saved after 30 minutes in church and we went 40. So I think <laughs> we ought to like, uh, wrap it up, but, um, Thank you so much for your time. I'm very, very excited about your book and it seems like it's going very well. So everyone follow her on the Insta. What is your, is it Tara Schuster? Yeah, I'm Tara Schuster. um, No underscore Tara Schuster on Instagram. And if you go to my website, taraschuster.com and sign up for my newsletter, there is this really cool community that has just sprung up. Like I didn't do it, but it's, we're calling ourselves team lilies and it's a group of like kind hearted, funny people who are just like, they're the kind of people who do roll their eyes a little bit at things at first, but are like willing to try. Um, And we're just this community of people trying things out and sharing our stories. And it's, been one of the most beautiful experiences I've ever been a part of is just watching it grow. So if you join the newsletter, you end up being able to join in with our Zooms and our meetups and all that kind of stuff. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Tara. It was great. Thank you for having me. Hi, and welcome to the Same 24 Hours Podcast. I'm Meredith Atwood, author of the book, The Year of No Nonsense. I'm a former attorney turned writer, speaker, and Ironman triathlete. Although right now, all I really like to do is lift weights. We all have the same 24 hours, but it's what we do in those hours that leads to our greatest health, happiness, and success. It's my goal to crack the code on a life of less nonsense so we can all make the most of our 24 hours. So let's get started.